Welcome. So glad you're able to be with us. I wish we were actually all together in uh, our physical presence, but I'm glad we're able to be here virtually. Um, and I hope you and your family and friends are doing okay today. Uh, this event at the uh, Directors Guild um, is one of our most popular events. Uh, we fill all of our theaters. And I'm about to introduce the nominees for Outstanding Director of uh, Feature Films. And when they would come forward in the theater, um, there would be a standing ovation um, as everybody came forward to acknowledge the remarkable work they're doing. They're not going to get that standing ovation, but I hope uh, the energy that you uh, <laughs> put out there to the screen uh, is an appreciation of the amazing work they're doing. And so let me first introduce um, Emerald Fennell for Promising Young Woman. Hi there, Em. Glad to have you here. David Fincher, director of Mank. And there's David. Great to have you here. Uh, Aaron Sorkin, director of The Trial of the Chicago 7. And we have Lee Isaac Chung, the director of Minari. And we have Chloe Zhao, the director of No Man Land. It is so great to have all five of you here at the same time. I don't know if you heard what I just said, but if we were in the theater at this moment, you would be being acknowledged by a standing ovation of uh, well over uh, seven, eight hundred people um, because of the amazing work you've done. And so thank you for sharing it. And as you know, this conversation we're about to have is with your peers. This is with directors. This is with um, the directorial team. And they're most interested in learning about how you do what you do. Um, you know, I was thinking about one idea that, that, that encompasses everything here, and that is that, uh, and this is a quote that Banksy, uh, uh, the, 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 the street artist, um, actually says, which is, uh, art is here to uh, um, comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. And in many ways, that's exactly what all of your films do in such different genre ways. Um, and just to get us started, I, I was thinking... Um, you're so <laughs> experienced now, all of you now, having done so many of these um, uh, video interviews that um, you may be zoomed out uh, doing them. So, and I was thinking that on the stage um, uh, years ago, Steven Spielberg was asking for advice uh, from Federico Fellini uh, after his first or second movie. And Federico said, you know, you're going to be asked lots of questions about your movie, and it's, you're going to get the same question over and over again, and you're going to get so bored. So what I suggest is, this is my advice to you, tell lies, make up stories. That's what you should do. So you don't bore yourself. Now, on stage happened to be Roberto Benini, who was also a Fellini uh, you know, a friend. And he was shocked. And he turned to Stephen and said, but, but Federico always said to me, you always have to tell the truth. And now I know he was lying. So <laughs> we're going to deal with what truth is you're all about to say. In fact, I'd like to oh. start the conversation. There you go. I'd like to start the conversation with, with advice that you've gotten from other directors, what you learned from other directors. And M, start, because you've seen and worked with many directors. <laughs> Any advice, particularly because this is your first feature? Um, God, I think, well, one of the, the worst advice I ever got was from someone who said, always do try and turn up on time, which really didn't seem <laughs> best advice in general um but actually you know a female director friend of mine uh said beware of the are you shores um she said uh often you'll find if you're you know if you're a first time filmmaker or if you're making a film in a place you've not worked for or you're a woman or any of those things what you'll find is you lose time because people there's a lot of are you sure and she she realised she was losing a couple of hours a day, not because people were being, um, not because they were being difficult. In fact, to the contrary, they were being helpful. Uh, but actually, that helpfulness was kind of slowing things down. And, and after the first week, she banned. She said, uh, "From now on, nobody asks. Are you sure?" And she said, she, literally, for the first week, <laughs> um, she would say, "Okay, I'm going to shoot it from here," and somebody would go, oh. <laughs> "So that was amazing advice." And, and you've seen um, and work with many directors. Um, have you seen things that you would have said, boy, that's something I'll never do, or that's something I want to do? 
oh god i mean it's such a personal preference isn't it i don't i don't respond very well to being frightened but some people really really do so i don't know i try not to be frightening but i can <laughs> it's probably be a bit occasionally i said directly Got it. Well, you're, you may scare us in a little bit, but we'll, we'll wait for the fear here. <laughs> David, for you, um, did, had, had you ever been given any advice from another director uh, uh, that you've taken or mm -hmm. learned from another director? And I know you've learned from Hitchcock, but I'm interested in how you would respond to this. Um, I, I actually had a, uh, an interesting piece of advice once from uh, Martin Scorsese, who, who, and I, I'm paraphrasing because, uh, but he was talking about. Um, he was talk. We were talking about style, and he said something along the lines of, um, "Remember, the things that you do poorly are as much a part of your style as the things that you do well, and and that's a great thing because otherwise everybody's everyone's movies would look, look like Citizen Kane." <laughs> And everyone would be trying to do that. And and it's a little bit, you know, when you try to do something like that and you fail in the inimitable way that you will fail, it's it's that is kind of your signature, you know. And and I think that, you know, I find that process over time is trying to mitigate it against the stuff that you want to take out of your uh, of your work, you know, and, and try not to punish yourself. Ah, that's a good one. I like that last one a lot. Aaron, um, you've had many directors work for you and you've worked for many directors. What advice have you been given um, that you remember or learn from other directors? Well, you know, uh, I directed for the first time just four years ago. Um, and now I'm in the middle of directing for, for the third time. But it was a little over 10 years ago that I was asked to direct. Uh, for the first time. Uh, I'd, I'd written a screenplay and the producer and the head of the studio uh, thought it'd be a, a good idea if I directed it. And uh, I, I went around and I spoke to a number of writers turned writer-directors uh, that I admire, including Jim Brooks, uh, right, who wrote and directed uh, the broadcast. And they were very encouraging, uh, saying, I know you think you can't do this, but you can do this, you're, you're ready uh, uh, to do this. So I was going to go ahead and direct that film, but I just made one suggestion. I said, before I commit to directing this, can we just send it to David Fincher? Uh, uh, he passes on everything, read it and pass on this, and then um, uh, I'll be ready to do it. And we sent it to David three hours later. Uh, I got an email from David saying, hey, David, hey, Aaron, it's David. I'm going to direct the social network. Can you come over? Uh, so uh, I, I, I would say I got lucky. Uh, that, uh, did, did, did I've you, learned did, did a you? lot from directors. I, I've had a chance to work with uh, great directors like David uh, and like Mike Nichols um, and uh, on three different television series. Tom uh, and uh, you'd have to really not be paying attention to uh, uh, to not learn a little bit from them. On the other hand, you know, trying to learn from David Fincher is like trying to watch Tiger Woods and then learn golf from him. It's it's not going to work the same when the golf club's in your hand uh, uh, than it, than it is in David. So. Um, you know, what I've learned is surround yourself with very talented people, uh, 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 DP, production designer, editor, costume designer, all, all of the department heads. Cast it well. Um, uh, uh, put, put great athletes on the field. Put great actors uh, uh, in the film. Give them a chance to do their best. Uh, uh, try to be clear. And hope that the screenplay uh, is good enough that everybody can understand what their role is in uh, in, in putting it on its feet and making it come alive. Aaron, did any of these directors, including David, warn you of something that you 
is a, is a you know a, a thing that you want might want to avoid as a director? You know, I'm uh, David was extremely generous with you know we, we, we talked time on the set and we, uh, uh, we we certainly talked a lot in the in the pre production period you know in the uh, working on the script uh, and so forth. I can't remember him telling me anything to do or to avoid, uh, but I will tell you that, as a matter of fact, the very first time I directed, it was 10 years ago, it was on a social network, because on the, on the last day of shooting, which was a Saturday, uh, there were three very easy things, relatively easy things, uh, that we had to get uh, on that Saturday. Uh, and we had gotten the second one, and David called me into his trailer. And first, he showed me some cut footage uh, uh, that he put together, which looked fantastic. And then he said, "Let me tell you what's going to happen now. Uh, uh, the last thing to get again, it, it, it was an easy shot that doesn't even last uh, two seconds. Uh, but he said, "Let me tell you what's going to happen now. I'm going to get into my car and leave, and you're going to direct uh, the final." shot on the schedule. And I laughed. I was sure that he was kidding. He said, no, uh, I'm serious. I'm going to get in my car and leave. Uh, and, and you're going to do this. And I still thought he was kidding, but suddenly people were coming up to me uh, to approve wardrobe, to approve background. Uh, Jeff Conan with the TP to approve the shot. Uh, and sure enough, David got in his car and left. Now, a big part of that may have been that David is not comfortable with the sentimentality of saying that. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure that was a lot of it. But at least some small part of it was David wanting me to understand this isn't like when the pilot calls you up to the cockpit when he <laughs> yeah. says, you're flying the plane now, uh, that he got off the lot to port <laughs> me uh, uh, to be the one in charge. We did one take. It was perfect. Uh, uh, I said, that's cut. That's great. Check the gate. Uh, the AD said, please, there is no way I can send David one take uh, of this. Uh, you have to do more. So I said, okay, let's do it again. Exactly the same way you just did it. Um, I don't know, David. I, I think we did two or three or four just to not get in trouble. But I agree. It was a moment that really meant a lot. Uh, uh, just that, 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 even if it was to get out of saying goodbye to him. Uh, I'd, I'd ask you what it's like to be directed by David, since you were directed by him in Social Network. We're going to save that for a second. Let me let, oh, God. Okay. let, let me ask I, Isaac Isaac the, the same question: uh, advice from other directors, or something that you learned from other directors. Um, you, you know, one, one that stands out to me, uh, I, I got to know a filmmaker uh, in Korea, a master filmmaker named Lee Chang-dong, and he, he directed mm -hmm. Burning. Um, and I remember I was talking to him about Minari, and we were talking about production design, and he just told me, as a general rule, don't, don't aim for perfection. Don't aim for perfection, but aim for human, like aim for the most human thing. And uh, he said that's that that's something that needs to be clear in all the production design, but it's also something to keep in mind for the film. I mean, aiming for protect, perfection is good, but the priority is always try to make it as human as possible. Um, and that that always stayed with me throughout the production of this film. But defining what that means, though, um, the distinction that you're making between sort of like perfection and human. Can you delve a little deeper from the yeah, advice we were just given? Well, we were talking about how um, a lot of things with, with people is just unpredictable and it, it can't seem too designed. It can't seem like someone from top down has designed it, but there's something from inside coming out from, from below. Um, so um, I, I like that advice. I like that idea of something surprising or something that is counterintuitive kind of coming from. Uh, from the characters of the film. Got it, got it. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, how about for you, Joe? Uh, Chloe, w what was uh, any advice that you ever got from um, uh, another director or learned from other directors? 
Yeah, well, the, there are two things. One is it, it was uh, some recently uh, it was wasn't from a director. It was from an exec. Someone said to me, um, "You don't have to be loud when you know you're in charge." That was really really helpful for me. Uh, not necessarily artistically, but just again, you know, Emerald, you 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 touch up a little bit. Just being someone coming into arena that I feel like I need to be on the defense all the time. Um, it was really helpful to to have someone say to me, "You know, you're in charge." You don't have to make sure people know you are because you are. That that would that saved me a lot of um, stress and and effort. The other thing is just uh, being um, around Werner Herzog, uh, who has been a mentor to me, and and um, you know going to Oktoberfest with him and watching how he explains um, grilled fish, for example, like that's how we get it on the street with this precision of uh, details that he knows about how fish is grilled and, and what temperature this from which river. And, and I remember him, um, you know, with the, the, he said, you can watch someone who is an expert on birds and learn a lot about filmmaking. There's something about that obsession about this thing. I used to feel bad that I'm so obsessed with my movie and just that's all I care about. I think about and I used to feel guilty about it. But he really made me feel, I know this is okay. That, that's what, why you would make it good because you become that completely. It was great to spend time with him. That's, that's, that's a wise piece of advice and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a real one. Um, what I'd like to ask all of you is, um, in fact, what your homework is the day or it might be a night shoot the night before. Um, what your homework is that you do the night before you're going on to the whatever that next day's or next night's shoot is, and what's the first thing you do when you go on the set? And and, and Chloe, I'm going to start with you. So in, in your movie, because you shot over a five month period, um, um, you were um, you know, so many different kinds of locations. The entire style of your film is, has this feel of um, discovery. Uh, as distinguished from it's already down here on paper, um, and we're now realizing that. Um, so I suspect that, that your homework uh, might have been different than another kind of film, or maybe it was the same. But what's, what, for all of you, what's the homework you do the night before, and what's the first thing you do when you walk onto a set? Chloe? The night before, for me, because I know I would be editing it, um, and also I'm writing it, so I had to watch the dailies. And I have to write, knowing like, okay, I think I've got enough. If I'm going to edit this thing, what else, what other scenes I need or what, what I need to change? I mean, everything, I'm sure everyone does that, but, but I'm, for me, it was an insular uh, process. And I have to rewrite the scenes for next morning. I try to get it to the producers by 6 a.m. so they can actually change things for on the day. First thing I show up is apologizing for changing everything. And then... <laughs> <laughs> who do you who do you apologize to first? Uh, to the producers and the ads and the actors, everyone, and then uh, uh, and then go find me something, uh, some breakfast that I can digest. Uh, Got it. And and who who actually are the first people that you do talk to uh, and meet with when you walk? My on DP. My DP. Got it. And 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 what will that conversation? If that's the first person that you engage with uh, when you walk and say, what will that conversation be about? Um, well, time of day was a huge part of how we planned the day. So uh, it, he, you know, I, I know that most of the time that he would have a plan to know that. Well, also, you don't know whether you're going to get on that day. So, so much is a, it's like a survival conversation. <laughs> of like, uh, you know, you don't know. So maybe someday a certain person isn't showing up or the whatever. It, it's, it's about readjusting, like resetting ourselves for a brand new adventure every single morning. Um, uh, I really plan could go out of the window. I, I'll, I'm going to use a specific example since that's the first person that you say you often talk to. Um, there's a very long tracking shot um, uh, with uh, Francis McDormand um, through one of the camps. Um, and it, and it's, a, it's a wonderful sort of journey that we take with her past the campers, past people in, you know, in different groups. Um, and, was that a shot? Would that be an example of where you will walk onto the set not having talked about it and figure that out? Or would that have been one that you would have talked about and thought about before the day of? Well, the, the goal is for you to feel like that we never talked about it and just showed up. 
but that was a shot that's that's planned month ahead. Every vehicle was brought in stage exactly where we needed to be. Every person is cued. Everybody knew they what they needed to do, and we can do one take every day because the sound has to be just at the exact spot to not blow up the sky, blow out the sky, and also at the same time not make the whole uh, foreground. Uh, uh, you know, you have to make sure that's not washed out either. So there's only like one moment we can do it. So that's the opposite of everything I just said. That's that. That's one where <laughs> you want it to feel like a magic trick. So the planning actually takes really long to get to that very moment. And uh, other situations that would be normal is you would walk onto let, uh, let's let's say if you're in uh, the Amazon um, um, location. Um, would you be walking onto the set and talking to your camera person and saying, these are the kind of shots I'm feeling from the work that you did the night before, thinking about how you were going to shoot it? If you can hear each other in there, um, <laughs> it's very, very loud. Um, it's one, it's one of those that, you know, we had to follow certain kind of safety rules. So we, we couldn't just do whatever we wanted. But in there, I didn't want to stage actual scenes that would need too much of my input. I, I relied quite a bit on, my DP and his visual, visual, uh, style to, to just go grab shots that, that later on in the edit, I knew he knew me enough to shoot enough to know that I can, I can, you know, the feeling of loneliness, feeling like having a small person in this big modern factory. I trust him to be able to get those shots and I trust Fran be able to really be in the moment in there working and give us something. She's such a brilliant actress and that's so much is found in the edit. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Isaac, for you, um, what's the homework that you would do before the next day shoot? And what's the first thing you do when you walk onto a set? Um, I, I was thinking about that. I don't remember too much that's systematic about my process with that. But uh, I, I try to catch up on decision making for the art department and costume and um, or, or wardrobe and uh and, and then just prepare the the next day. Like I, I definitely sit down with a call sheet and really figure out how we're going to map out the day um, it, between me and the DP. Um, so usually in the morning, I do grab a quick coffee and breakfast and I, I just go and sit with uh, my DP and we just talk through what we're going to get. We didn't have much time. We had about uh, we didn't go into overtime any day and we, we shot for like 25 days. And, uh, with, with Alan, our youngest actor, we could only have him on set for six hours because of the travel time between the hotel and location. Um, so every scene we knew we only have X number of shots or setups that we can do. So, um, that was kind of the challenge of, of this one where we had to strategize like what, where do we devote the most time and, and, and all those things. So. Um, I found that conversation with Lockie, our, our DP, incredibly helpful, uh, just to be on the same page so that we don't have to waste time doing that throughout the day. Would you would you then be with him if he's the first person you're speaking to after after having the coffee and, and maybe the egg sandwich? Yeah. <laughs> would you be talking about a shot list or or uh, or the intention of of what you know the number of of shots that you needed to get within? this particular day? And what would that right. happen be? It would be a combination of both, but a lot of it was uh, the shot list, talking through the shot, the, the setups and, and things like that, that, that we would need. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And how about for you, Aaron, when, when you um, uh, um, do the homework before the next day sh shoot? Now, I know um, you had two different kinds. I'm, I'm sure when you were doing the action sequences, I know this is newer for you, so that's got to have been a re real complex homework way, way before you actually did it. But let's say if, if it's a scene um, that was one of the trial scenes, um, what's your homework before uh, uh, that evening? And then when you walk on the set, uh, what's the first thing you do? Am I back? Yeah, you're back. You're, you're back. back. Yeah. You're oh, okay. So, it, so what would be your homework? Sure it me? wasn't worth the effort. But, um, <laughs> uh, the, the night before an action scene, on Chicago 7, um, I would Google how to fake your own death. Um, <laughs> see if I can find anything there. But what I uh, what I do uh, the night before is uh, I would say I, I reread the scene and I'll I'll write to the actors. I'll, I'll send an email to the principal actors uh, in the scene, um, just talking to them about one or two general things that are important to me that they keep in mind. And usually it's something along the lines of 
keep it simple. Uh, uh, that the, the writing in this scene, um, is, is gonna start to flirt with melodrama. Uh, it's gonna kind of walk right up to melodrama and, and introduce itself. And you have to not lean into that. You have to fight mm -hmm. against that, uh, uh, and, uh, and keep it simple. Um, and, and then just some cheerleading. You're gonna be great. You've been doing great. You're gonna just have fun, uh, uh, doing it. Um, it's, there are probably, uh, maybe one or two shots, uh, that are, that I want to make sure I get that are important to me. You know, we need to understand that we are inside this person's head. So we got to get this, uh, which if we have to make sure this is going to live in coverage, we've got to, uh, uh, make sure of that. And then when I get to the set, uh, in the morning, yeah, the first person you're talking to, uh, is, is the DP and the first AD, uh, is there. Uh, and, we're, we're talking about the scene, uh, and, uh, we'll talk about the, the master, uh, and, uh, uh and how we're gonna move in, and then talk about those shots that I've written down that, uh, that I wanna make sure, uh, that I get. Uh, that, that's usually it. Got it. Got it. And M, how about for you? Um, what's the homework that you do uh, the night before, and uh, what's the uh, first thing you do when you get on the set? This is my first film, so I, I sort of don't know if it's an established system or or kind of one born of necessity. But for this, um, I didn't. Things sound very bad. All of the homework that I did was before we started shooting. And it was years of obsessive, um, detailed And so that, uh, and then for me and Ben, the amazing DP, we went as, as much as we could. We were very, very, very obsessive and detailed location photographs and we tried to do the shot list actually before we even started as much as we could without it being too restrictive because, like, like Isaac, we had no time, and we also had no prep time, really. So when it when it came to the conversation of the first morning, it would usually be the most because we're still sort of in casting at some stages. You know, the, the art department was still making significant well, um, yeah, props and building sets and things. So it was kind of logistically, on the morning, it was kind of working out. Like what, what disaster had happened. <laughs> but usually it was okay. But in terms of the night before, I can't tell you, I just slept. Slept. <laughs> not everybody, not everybody <laughs> can sleep the night before, but okay, you slept. And, 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 and when you're, when you walk onto the set, what's the first thing you do? And by the way, I, I know that we're having, because M, you are in London at this moment, and, and I, there may be some sound stuff that we're hearing in and out. So if you see us go like that, it's just because oh. it's not your problem. It's the, it's, 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 the, it, it's, 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 it's the cable underneath the ocean. Um, I'm sorry. Much, no, no, it's not. I just wanted you to know if you see better. us do that, that's why. But um, what, what, what is the first thing you do when you get on set? Um, on set, uh, well, first thing I'll do when I get there, uh, I, I'll eat something. But the first thing on set is, is just kind of, I don't know, it's that thing of like taking the gauge, like what's the temperature? What's everyone's like emotional temperature that day? Cause you kind of, there's vibe every morning, mm -hmm. depending on how the night before went and all of that stuff. So I think it's kind of getting, for me, getting the sense of how everyone's feeling. Uh, before then being like, okay, we've got another impossible day ahead. So like, let's do it. This is what we're doing. Where do you, where do, M, where do you put yourself when you're on set? Um, you know, the world of video village, the world of monitors, the world of actually getting right next to the lens so that you can be with uh, the actors and everything else is behind you. Where, where are you, um, um, when you are working on set? Um, I'm at the monitor, at my sort of hovering between my, mine and Ben, DP's monitors, like slightly uh, interfering nature. Um, but generally, I don't want to be in the actor's eye line if I can help it. I want to kind of be, I need to be looking, I need to be looking at what I'm going to be seeing 
because I think I can very easily get beguiled by what's happening in the room. So I need to kind of keep myself away and stay quite focused on the screen. And when you want to give a note to your actor, since you're behind the monitor, I don't know what the monitor is, it's close to the camera, wherever you put them, what's your process? Uh, go, go in, go in, quietly talk to them. Got if it. they're being naughty, shout from my monitor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair enough, but I thought you didn't like that idea that belligerence here. Right? <laughs> well, not sure. I wouldn't. I would never shout cruel obscenities. It might, you know, if they if they're, <laughs> <laughs> if they're giggling, or you know, or we're up against it, and they need a bit of kind of sternness, then occasionally you'll hear the kind of voice of God, the cranky voice of God. Right. But in general, I want to go in and like you know have a private conversation. Got it, got it. David, for you, um, where are you in relationship to monitors? And when you want to give notes to your actors, uh, what's your process? Um, well, I, I am, unfortunately am crippled and hamstrung by this idea of using, I use two cameras uh, almost all the time because I, I like to plan for things that I need um, to have real tight continuity matches. And so I will it, uh, almost invariably. It's a it's a rat fuck to get from monitors to to the cast. And so I will, you know, I'll I'll t fight my way through it a first couple times, and then you know, usually they clear some space for me because I'm you know grumbling and what the fucking spaghetti and. Um, but uh, I th I think that um, I think that you I think. My personal um, taste is that I want to see what the audience is seeing. I, I, I'm all for, and I think that there are times when, when, when you and I don't shoot a lot of Warner Brothers close-ups, but when you're shooting something that's that intimate, you know, you do want to kind of, you know, tuck in by the map box to see, to kind of get a, a feel a, as to what what's being presented. Um, but for the most part, I want to see it through. Through, I want to see it the way the audience is going to see it, which is, you know, in in the beginning, why I resented the whole idea that digital cameras had to have a, a rotating mirror so that the DP could see the light falling on the actors, but no one else could. You know, everybody everybody else was stuck with a 1080p monitor, and um, so I I I like very much. I d I work through a camera. I almost. I mean, I'll watch a rehearsal or I'll watch a, a, a number of rehearsals without having monitors up. But I, I, um, you know, from the time you, from the time we set a master or, or a master and an alternate master, the rest of the day is working through the camera because that's the only thing that matters. Got it. Got it. Um, and, and when you do, uh, uh, if you want to give a, uh, an adjustment, you will, um, squeeze yourself through those two cameras. Um, uh, well, I, I tend to, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I, I tend to shoot a lot of takes and I, um, <laughs> and I tend to like the idea of giving, uh, of inundating actors with notes and, and, and giving them and, and, you know, this can make people the first couple of times very, very uncomfortable. It's like you just gave me 12 notes and it's a nine minute take and we're starting from the beginning again. And what am I supposed to do? And I'm, and my attitude is you're supposed to the stuff that you can respond to. You're supposed to respond and the rest, any, anything that goes in one ear and out the other, don't sweat like the stuff you, I'm going to give you 12 or 15 things and the, the stuff that sticks is the stuff that you're going to relate to. And we're just trying. We're not, there's no expectation that the next one is the one. I want to, I want to create an environment where, listen, we've talked about it for three weeks in rehearsals. We've rehearsed it for an hour and a half in the morning. Once we lock in on what it is, then I just want that. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, meet Mr. Lincoln, but it, but it has to be repeatable to, to, to the extent that I can coverage. And, and, and my process is, is, is not, you know, John Houston used to shoot, you know, the first six lines in the master and the last seven lines in the master and then go in for coverage. And, and I do, 
I will shoot a master until I feel I could play the entire scene in the master. And then I will shoot an over until I feel I could sh play the entire scene in an over. And then I will shoot the singles and, and I will go at that. And it's not to, you know, it's not to grind people into dust. It's simply to say, you know, Emerald said you, there, you take the temperature of, of the, of everybody involved in that morning and you're sort of, you know, adjusting the sliders. I tend to be like, I'm very, I want to be sensitive to what people are going through, but I want you to leave that shit at the door. <laughs> and then I want you to concentrate on exactly what it is that we have to do so that I can, if, if need be, cut the scene from a perspective that maybe wasn't the one that I had been thinking about for, you know, in the case of this movie, 30, 30 years. Got it. Got it. Um, uh, th thank you for that. Um, because the perspective of, of, of shooting the whole scene and getting it right in whatever angle it is, rather than, as you were saying, Houston sort of getting the, the close up when he wanted it and the wide shot getting out of it. Uh, Chloe, what, what about for you? Where are you, uh, um, when you're shooting? Um, well, it's, it's really interesting. Well, you know, what David was just saying, even though I come at a very different, um, method, for me, but I, but I, for me, it's always like, it's what's on the camera that's the most, that, that's it. You know, that's the difference between film and theater, even though people think I might be more, because I work with a lot of non-professional actors, I'm usually like right there with them and watching them. I wish I'm, I used to romanticize, I wish I'm that kind of director, but I learned very much when we watch dailies and I go, that is not what I felt it over there. I had to sit calmly in front of uh, a monitor. A lot of times we have the sun right there. I only can do one take. Actually, it, you know, it's very camera driven. Many times an, our non-professional actor will be a little bit less um, care about this than our professional actors. I need to learn how to make them more comfortable. It's like, I just need to do this. You don't have to know why. You don't have to, I just, because uh, in my, in my head, I'm editing it. Like it's on survival mode. I'm never going to be back in this location again with these people at this time of the day. So I need exactly what I needed in the edit room to make it work. And so with non-professional actors, they would just do one smile for me, one look here, there, so to patch it together. And friend, again, is just so good at that. She would give me like five different reactions for no reason why. And so I, later on, I can, put it together and and so it's still actually very camera driven is is i is whatever we need it later even though it's coming from a different angle um, so but where where are you actually positioned are you next to your camera operator or are you, is, you, you, shoot, you shoot 360 you don't really have a place you could sit down and watch so i would i would have something with me the whole time so i could either hide behind the car or um, I will walk behind the camera. It's not ideal to walk behind the camera because you still have the adrenaline of the scene. You're not making the best judgment whether what you capture is actually reflecting that for the audience that's going to sit still watching it. So if I can, I try to squat. <laughs> I can fit in very tiny spaces, uh, very flexible. So you can, <laughs> I can hide in a lot of places. And, and that's why I try to find a position that is still. And I, I watch monitor, but I never, I don't really have a tent or anything like that. But the monitor is small. Got it. So you're having, you're, you're carrying kind of a clamshell and moving as, uh, as close as to your people or getting out of the way where your camera is going to move. When I would love like a rod for something, you know, like something I can wear just so I can, so I can hide. We got to get you an endorsement for Google Glass or something. <laughs> there, there you go. Ooh, That's right here. Yeah. When you, when you want to give adjustments, and we're going to talk about this, uh, 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 further but um since you're what you're there um how are you operating well will you then then step forward in front of the the lens or how you know how, how are you giving your adjustments to your actors at this moment it's a mixture i i will shout if it's like the sun is about to set and i'm further away i'll just shout it's like it's, it's, it's and i apologize later and um and then <laughs> or or in advance yeah. and they all know they all know i magic hour anything goes uh, everything will be forgiven. And then other times, obviously, when someone's talking about something so intimate, both friend and a non-professional actor, it's about clearing the two people that we have on set and then just whisper into their ears, hold their hands. And it, it really depends on what, what we're talking about. 
Gotcha. I'm, I'm going to stick with you for another question, which is a little bit more ahead of us, ourselves, which is when you want to give an adjustment to an actor, what you do. Um, and I want to hear from all of you how you, uh, you, know, you, you, if you want to change something on set, what, what you do to and uh, uh, get that change. But I, I'm sort of really interested in, in, Chloe, while we're talking here, and when you're talking to your actors, um, particularly to your uh, non-actors, and you want them to do something different, what's your process here? Because um, I know some of the pieces, like the interview with, uh, with the vet uh, um, or some people telling uh, stories, Bob, I think, talking, uh, some of these people are really, if you were making a documentary, this might be what they would say. But the relationship sort of with Linda May and with, with uh, uh, Swanky, I mean, they're, um, there's a, they're real performances here. So I'm curious if you want to have a change, but I'm just thinking when Swanky gets sick um, and um, she, you know, how did you, if you wanted to adjust, what would you be saying and how would you do that, particularly with your non-actors? I want to take credits for those great performances, but it's really not, I don't, I would not go in there and say, give me 50% of that. Or like, you know, actually needs to be more hopeful. I, I will never do that. It's really, I, I've heard those speeches before and I've written them in the right part of the script for it to work in the film. And then they just need to be able to deliver on set. Uh, cause, cause they're not cast to, to work or even have that ability to do that kind of performance that require an actor to do. Um, so. Not so much. If, if anything, is about trying to make them feel comfortable. Uh, and then if there are certain lines that I, I feel like they're going to interesting directions about writing the moment with them together, and they just need to be really a version of themselves. Got it. But for, for example, in that moment when she starts to get sick and she holds her head. And, oh, yeah. That's a, that's a real, if you will, that's a performance moment. I, I, I assume that, that that was not what was happening to her. But that's what you wanted to happen to the character. Um, can yeah. you talk about that? Um, well, Swanky was a living per living interpreter. You know that when you go to a museum, sometimes there's like she. I think she was like in the Prairie Wind Museum in Indiana. Like so, she does like historic life interpretation. Things. She will she will pretend to be a carpenter's wife from the 18th century all 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 day long. So I think she's got that natural. You know, I just told her like. I explained the scene to her and then she did it and it, it looked pretty <laughs> realistic. Again, I, I look, I, I, I have, when I work with professional actors, I feel like there is that we can craft it more. And, and with non-professional actors, a lot of times they, you cast them in the right role and you write for them and your job is half down. You really, it's impossible to have a whole cast of non-professional actors and expect them to give you a whole variety. Of person performance, that's and it's not the best way to use them or or your time. And when you talk to them in the process, uh, one more question for you here: as you're meeting them, like finding out that Swanky actually was quote a performer, or uh, uh, knowing um, sort of what Bob uh, uh, did. Um, when you're meeting these people for for their first time in casting, what is your process of conversation with them so that you then know you can trust them to when you're on set, be who they are when you're just meeting them? It is, um, I put a camera on them almost right away with their permission, just a cell phone, and just to see if they're okay not looking at the camera. You know, I wouldn't be able to do it. It's not like every non-professional actor can just be themselves in front of the camera. That's that, And it's, it's more about how they can trust me. Um, and it's about getting past that type of um, um, talk that they expect me to do about their lifestyle, their struggles, their politics, is to get past all of that and get to like, uh, what's the first time you fall in love? You know, your first kiss, your football team, and get to that point. And then, and then, so then they can start telling you a bit more about who they are and then finding that essence of, of, of um, what is about them that, that make you want to go, go um, be close to this person that everyone else will understand. And then, pull a little piece of dialogue from there and build that character and then actually change the arc of your main character so that moment can be included in the film. It's an interesting thing. Would, what percentage of the people that you would be in conversation with do you think you would not use? I mean, would you meet 10 people of which one is going to be a swanky or Linda May? Uh, yeah. 
Probably. I hope so. Got it. So there, there really is, quote, a casting process of the non-actor to, to get see, to see how intimate and present they can be with you. If that's my phrase. I, but I, I don't think it's that different than not, the, the process of finding a professional actor, right, for the role. You got to audition them. It's just you're looking for different crafts, different skills. And and the one, if you were to say the one skill that you really do want to have with any of your non-professionals, what would that skill be if there were a way to describe it? Be in their body, be present, be physical, not intellectual. It's super important for non-professional actors because they, if they're being intellectual, they can't really translate into physical like trained actors. They just need to, if they get cold, they just need to feel cold and, and not try to go, oh, maybe I shouldn't feel pretend to not feel cold right now. They should just be present the whole time because the, the work we do in those moments is to try to, maybe I'll whisper something to friend. She will say something that might bring something out of them. Um, if they're not present, if every time something changes, they look at the camera and look at me, then I won't be able to do the kind of work with you. Got it. Got it. So presence. Thank you for that. Isaac, for you, where do you position yourself um, on the set? Where are you? Um, it, it depends on the scene. Normally, I do have a, a handheld monitor as well. I think I'm often hiding <laughs> like uh, Chloe is. I, um, I try to be flexible, too, but... Um, I, I do notice I, I try to be next to the camera uh, so that I can just peer up when I want to or when I need to, because sometimes I, I do find that that presence is necessary. But um, it depends on also the actors in the scene. If they're if the little boy, David or Noel, um, Noel or Alan are in a scene, often I like to be closer to them out of frame because sometimes I want to whisper something that they might say uh, while we're rolling. Um, and I've already told them, you know, don't react to me whispering something to you. Just, just repeat it. Um, so sometimes I'd be off frame, just ready to say something to them. But, but I, I'd have my monitor there, uh, trying to see what I'm getting as an audience member. Speaking, speaking of whispering, there's a moment when, uh, when uh, David, the little boy, um, is meeting the grandma, and he whispers something into um, his mother's ear, and she pulls him and has it whisper it a second time. Um, yeah. We never find out what that whisper is. I mean, we might be guessing it because of the early part of the relationship. But do you remember uh, how you staged that with him and, and, and talking to him and what you told him? Well, um, uh, she, the mother ends up repeating, oh, he said, uh, you don't look like a real grandma um, or yeah, something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. So she, he does whisper that, like he does whisper that into her ear. Um, one one of the elements that I staged with that one though is that we we didn't tell him that uh, Yoon Ya Jung, the the veteran Korean actress, that she's going to put that uh, chestnut in her mouth and then hand it to him. And I just I just told him in this scene, uh, your grandma is going to give you something to eat and just eat it. That's that's how this scene is going to end. Um, but <laughs> she put it in her mouth and gave it to him, and then him backing away. That was a real reaction. Wow. <laughs> You know, we tried to get stuff like that that a kid, you know, would honestly respond to. Um, and I, yeah, that, that was a moment that really pleased me. By the way. <laughs> In looking at that moment, I thought you must have said to him, this, I'm really sort of fascinated with this moment. I thought you must have said to him, when she offers you this thing, pull away, which is in fact what he does. So I thought you directed him. In fact, if I'm understanding you, you did just the opposite. The direction was the to opposite, take it, yeah. and he just says, I'm not going to take this thing. Yeah. <laughs> He's <laughs> calculating right there. I know I was told to eat it. <laughs> and, you know, that kind of fits with the character. Like, he's as a good Korean boy, he's been told he's got to do the right thing, but <laughs> you know, he's not wanting to do it right then. <laughs> but it, 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 pursuing this on uh, one more level, would you, if you then wanted to do, quote, take two with this, what would you do? I mean, because um, you, you, you may not have. You may have said, I've got it. I, I said I got it with that one. I, I remember um, if, if it were to take two, we would have just tried to do it over again. But I I know for a fact we would have lost the magic of it. And that's why yeah. we all were keeping quiet about what we're about to do. And and that's why we also gave him the coverage first. We, we made sure to cover him with that kind of it's a medium shot, I think, of okay. that moment. And, and then we did like a master after that. Got it. Hmm. Got it. Right, right. Aaron, where where do you position your, yourself um, uh, and uh, in shooting? And, and if you want to give uh, whatever adjustments, uh, what's your process? 
I'm, I'm usually uh, at the monitor. Uh, sometimes I've got uh, the handheld uh, monitor so I can be a little closer. Every once in a while, um, uh, an actor wants me even closer. They'll, they'll want a line reading uh, uh, sometimes. Um, uh, so I'll be sitting there and I'll say, say it for me. Uh, so I'll be there. As far as giving notes, uh, first of all, I, I try not to do it so publicly. I don't want the actor to feel like they're, they're being told they've done something wrong, uh, in front of everybody. And I don't want them feeling like now everybody is going to watch to see how they responded, uh, to this note. Sometimes you can't really help it because the movie set is uh, it's very crowded. But uh, I learned something. That there, there's an actor I've, I've worked with uh, a, a lot, Jeff Daniels. Uh, and I asked Jeff, uh, how, how much or how little do you want to hear from the director while, while you're shooting the scene? And he said before we're shooting the scene, in rehearsal, the night before, that morning. Talk to me uh, as much as you want. Say whatever you want. Once you start shooting the scene in between takes, say it in five words or less. Um, <clears throat> so I try to get the actors uh, in the scene to the point uh, where all I have to say uh, between takes uh, is uh, a little hotter, a little colder. Um, uh, I'll pace it up a little here, bit here, but take the time there, leave room for this, uh, that kind of thing. Got it. In, in a scene like, and, and thank you, that's, uh, um, that's actually quite valuable. Um, um, in a scene of like uh, the argument between uh, Tom Hayden and Kunstler, um, uh, where there's a lot of overlapping and in intensity, um, how are you um, speaking to those actors at that particular moment where, in fact, it is um, uh, sort of overlapping of some of the, the, the dialogue that you, you, you've written uh, you, in that particular scene? Do you remember what you said to them? Or, yeah, or sure. Uh, well, first of all, it's two great actors, right? It's Mark Rylance and Eddie Redmayne, um, yeah. uh, who, who need no acting lessons and who have been looking forward to this scene for, for, for months. Uh, so... Uh, in, in a scene like that, again, it's, it's going to be, uh, a, a lot of technical musical stuff. I, I write a lot of, um, interruptions, uh, 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 whether a character is interrupting themselves, uh, with another thought, whether they're being interrupted by someone else. And, uh, I, I need to constantly remind the actor to not anticipate, uh, being interrupted. Uh, I really like the sound of two or more people speaking uh, at once. Um, and so where in the script, the line will be interrupted with a, a dash dash. Uh, I'll, I'll tell them what the rest of that sentence was going to be. Make sure that, th that they put the burden on the other actor. Make them stop you from talking. Don't stop because the script uh, uh, told you to stop. Um, and similarly, the actor who's doing the interrupting, um, interrupt them as soon as you hear the word uh, that is making you say no. That you know it didn't happen that way. That it's making you uh, argue with them. Don't wait for the moment uh, in the script. Uh, so with Eddie and uh, and Mark, it was that they had asked me to write the whole thing right because uh, we keep. Cutting away to uh, uh, to the early moments of the riot and how right. that uh, uh, suddenly exploded. We keep cutting away to Abby, uh, who's doing you know Abby stand up that he would do in colleges uh, uh, on the weekends. And so they they asked me to write the whole scene to fill in the blanks uh, for them. Uh, so I did, uh, and then we shot the whole thing. Uh, as if there were somewhere around here is a film of uh, them doing the whole thing without cutaways uh, to these other moments. Um, but honestly, I, I, could, I could be wrong. I could be remembering it incorrectly, but I don't remember having to 
gas those two guys up at all. Uh, Aaron, Aaron, did you shoot because of this? And David was just talking about that earlier about shooting multiple cameras for something like this, where that interruption was happening. Were you doing multiple cameras, or were you, this is not? Where are you with multiple cameras? We used multiple cameras as often as we could, two and sometimes three. Um, uh, with that third camera, with the C camera, uh, being an operator who was just looking for things. Uh, okay, the A and the B camera, you know, had a, a very strict assignment of, uh, of what they needed to do. The C camera operator uh, uh, was, you know, told to make a documentary, find, you know, find someone's hands going like that. Um, uh, uh, in that particular scene, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot remember uh, how many cameras Faden had working, but it was probably at least two, because in a scene like that, frankly, in, in almost every scene in the movie, uh, there, there are a lot of people in the scenes, a lot of coverage to get, Got it. and not much time to get it. Got it. Um, let's talk about um, redirection. Um, and, 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 Em, I'm going to ask you first again, if you don't mind, um, in terms of when you had to, or when you wanted to, um, give a note to your actor, um, what would you do? How, how would you get that performance changed if you needed to? Now, look, I mean, obviously you're working with some absolutely wonderful actors in your, your movie. Um, so that may not have been a problem, but there may have been adjustments. And because that's something that we all, face as directors, um, how to adjust the performance so it becomes what it is that we think is going to be the most honest and powerful. Um, we need to be able to uh, deal with this. So for M, if there are any specifics that you remember where you needed to readjust and how you did it. I mean, it, I think it really depends on the act you're working with because they all respond pretty differently to different kind of leads. But I mean, firstly, Carrie, who is in and 90% of the movie is so intuitive that it's kind of, she needs very little. Often it was just a matter of pushing, pushing her to do kind of more in a funny way. She's so naturally um, understated. And um, but really usually I think if, if you want something, it's not, it's not necessarily performance thing it's usually the kind of psychology like what why are you asking the thing that you're asking as a director what why do you need that thing so i think the, the moment that i'm thinking of specifically is in the first time we see the first time cassie is taken home by this guy called jerry who was played by adam brody it was really important to me that he wasn't skeezy which obviously is kind of a like contradiction when he's trying to introduce a chronically drunk woman. But it was important that it felt like a romance from his side. So, you know, all of the direction there was kind of counterintuitive. It was like be gentle, be tender. The more tender you are, the more you think that this is romantic, the more you believe when you kiss her, it's the most romantic kiss in the world. That's what makes this scene chilling. Not chilling if you're just a skis getting your end away hard and can. And, and I think for me, it's always about what that, what do we think we're doing? As, as much as what are we doing? What do we think we're doing? If we think we're a hero and that goes against what's happening in the script, play the hero. You know, that, that's usually what, um, and it's given permission as well. I think partly just more generally for people to fuck up. I like, I usually will want a take that is just uh, uh, not playful, playful, so white, but kind of, you know, somebody needs to like kick over some. There's, there was a bit that happened in rehearsal that sadly we, we didn't catch, but there's a scene where uh, the character of Ryan, who's played by Bo Burnham, is sort of, you know, uh, for the first time in his life, sort of contradicted or caught doing something and Bo instinctively I sort of said I, I think something along the lines of you're a little boy you know you've just been you've just been scolded and you're a little boy like what are you gonna do just <laughs> this grown man in a doctor's jacket he just 
he's during in the middle of the scene when he didn't get what he wanted, he just kicked he just kicked his desk like in the most gloriously petulant way. And actually, it was in the end, it was too much. But that's the kind of thing that you want. You want the moments where you let yourself. I want to see the moments where we let ourselves down and we are transparent and we are kind of pathetic. That's what I suppose I'm interested in. Or certainly I was interested in this film. So it's, it's, actors want to be sexy. They want to be villainous. But in a, in a specific way, they don't want to be weak and needy and all of the things that, that we are, really. So it's it's getting everyone to be comfortable enough to be their most pathetic. pathetic. <laughs> But I'm, 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 at being an actress yourself and having been directed, and uh, the question then becomes, what's effective? And of course, everybody's different, so you're going to use different language and different intentions depending on where, how you're going to do this. But um, sometimes, the, the, if, if you're asking be pathetic, a result may may be exaggerated and not happen. So I don't think that's what you're speaking to. No, so absolutely not. So I think the thing is, is that well, it's it's sort of again what Isaac said about eat the eat the food it's the it's kind of the your your if i know what i want is someone to be pathetic what then the direction is is play the romantic hero here do the do the sexiest tenderest kiss you can do here because don't worry about the fact that she's not responding that she's doing nothing because the more you but the more that kiss is Romantic in your head, the more repellent it is to us as an audience. That's it's but, always- but there's an interesting thing, and I really want you to talk to this for a second because do you want your actor to know that by what he or she's doing, it's going to have this result, meaning it's going to be pathetic and, and repulsive, or do you want the actor to only commit to the idea, which is, you know, romance her? Um, and so, uh, I'm, uh, you know, the awareness level of an actor to, to uh, in terms of the effect it's going to have on, quote, an audience versus the awareness level of an actor in the midst of a scene doing something as the character they're playing. That's sort of what I'm exploring. This yeah, way. I see. No, I mean, I'm not trying to trick anyone. You know, they, they these people know who they're playing. It's just, I think, it's that often actor, you know, often actors rightly are very... You know, they're looking at the text and they're looking and they know, you know, they know more than the character knows always. And so it's trying to get them back to the place of being the person. It's trying to get them back to where the audience is. You know, if we don't, we don't know anything yet. We don't know who this person is. So you, you, what I'm always trying to do is take the context away from the actor, not by kind of misleading them, but by saying, don't forget here. But in this moment, you, you're good. You think you're a good person. You're not playing. You're not playing a bit. You're, it's, it's sort of that thing. I would never deliberately at least try and kind of fuck with someone to get. Got it. The, 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 the issue of, of sort of playing, and, and this happens in, in, in a couple of the, uh, the movies we're seeing here. Um, the issue of playing drunk, um, and, and how drunk. Um, uh, how did you and Carrie um, get to, and obviously she's playing drunk at certain times, but what was the either rehearsal process, if you had one, um, or, you know, the discussion process that got you what you wanted there? Well, I think the first thing, again, it's, it's such an unusual thing because Car- Carrie, um, she was really nervous about it um, because I think it is famously something that could, can be so bogus so quickly. The great thing is, is that Cassie is pretending. She's so, so it doesn't matter if it feels phony, which I think gave her a bit of freedom. It may, it meant that she didn't have to be quite so meticulous because actually underneath everything, she is completely sober. And so that kind of, I think, gives her some power to, you know, to be a little bit more, I don't know, messy than I think probably Karen actually would be. But Alison Brie, uh, who plays Madison. Yeah, right. Playing, yeah. And she's, you know, it's, she's just brilliant. But it's also it's just about the context too. It's about making sure that she's got a red wine now. You know, it's, it's little things that you those kind of details that sort of make it really help you when you're an actor when you when you kind of um yeah you can kind of taste it and it's a little bit bleak, but yeah. 
when you when she knocks down that glass of wine, um, can, do you remember how that uh, evolved? Uh, because that is sort of a, an expression of because um, we some of us have been there at a certain point. You do knock down the glass of wine because you are that inebriated. Um, can you talk about that process of that scene? Yes, I mean it, it's sort of quite difficult stuff like that because of course it is fairly thudding visual metaphor. <laughs> Of <laughs> the red spilling over, but so it kind of had to be very specifically placed. And I remember because we only had two tablecloths, <laughs> just to be like a quite tight budget. Um, and so, uh, you know, you just it, again, it's, well, it's, it's kind of um, what Aaron said: don't anticipate that it's going to go a certain place. Just, just do a big gesture, and if you hit the one this time, great. If you don't, you know, we'll, we'll do it again. I, I mean, it's so it's so difficult. These kind of conversations are so complicated because I think so much of you conflates what you wish you'd done, the kind of director you hope you are, and the actual truth. And I'm not sure, you know, when it comes to like being precise about those particular moments, I'm never quite sure exactly how it was done. Got it. Do you remember the scene with uh, how the Alfred Molina scene was done? This is the scene with the lawyer uh, who is asking for forgiveness. I mean, that seems what the scene is. And, it, and it, I found it uh, quite remarkable. And I'm interested if you remember um, if you needed to do anything with these two fine actors, what adjustments you may or may not have gotten, including the physicality, because there's a real physicality. I mean, and I don't know if that was written in the script that he's going to get on his knees and he's going to almost put his head in her, in her lap or whether that evolved in rehearsal. But if you remember, sh share it with us. Yeah, so I think, well, actually, that was probably the most, I don't know, like, allegorical scene of the whole film and the most sort of overtly biblical maybe and so the, the thing I did do with Alfred and and Carrie was I showed them Michelangelo's Pieta uh, at the beginning and said I need you to get here at the end and they both kind of said fuck you <laughs> and I, is it, it's so counterintuitive no actor wants to get it it's so hard it's so kind of overblown and overwrought but the scene, you know, this is a scene about two people who, who are mad, who are, who have gone mad on different sides of the same, in, you know, in the same kind of way. So it would feel kind of over the top in a way. But the thing that I think is helpful was that he's frightening. He's physically an imposing person. Again, we as an audience don't know what he's going to do. And she doesn't know. And it was important that we felt the we felt him getting closer to her and that part of the forgiveness that she gives him is that she's disgusted by his proximity but she needs him to get away from her and and his groveling is so kind of touching but also repellent that it it's you know it didn't I didn't feel like I was gonna I didn't feel like we were gonna get to the place of forgiveness with them sitting kind of politely at the car. So uh, would you would you have rehearsed this scene um, before you started shooting it, and would you have also said literally in terms of technically that uh, obviously showing Michael and Angela a piece they are together, of course, uh, Christ and his mom. Uh, would you have um, literally sort of said, "I want you to do," and again, I, it, we're we're delving into the specific if you can, and if you remember, just because that we're learning from it. Um. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we, we very rarely rehearse. We very, you know, except, you know, a couple of times we didn't really have time. For this, it took a while to make that feel. For every, for I think everyone to kind of get on the same page as to why it was happening. And that the discomfort was kind of crucial. Rather than sometimes you find with actors, they, they feel uncomfortable when they don't want to do, not because it's not right, but just because they don't want to do it. And you're always trying to work out, like, are they, are they being, are they trying to protect themselves or are they right? You know, you kind of have to make that thing sometimes. And, but I knew with this, in this case, what I needed and it, it, we needed to rehearse it a few times so that they kind of understood. Not that it ever felt comfortable, but that they understood what it was for. Um, and so, yes, that, that was kind of probably the most rehearsed of the scenes that we had. Got it. And the physical action itself, did you say to them, or, or to Alfred, 
Alfred, I want you to get on your knees and put your hand on oh, them. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I showed so them. So it's very specific. Very specific. I showed them the picture. I said, you need to be on your knees. You need to be begging for forgiveness in every conceivable way. Did you say a word like, because sometimes when we're talking about this process, we talk about, you know, active verbs and acting teachers teach that, et cetera. Did you say something like to her, push him away? Or, or would you, what would, what kind of language might you use? I, I, I wouldn't probably have been that prescriptive about the actual action. Usually it's like the note in a scene like that would probably be like, what if he's going to hurt you? Like how big he is, like how close he's getting. What if, what if he, when he touches you, what's he going to do? I think that's the thing. Again, it's that like always remembering that, you know, what are you doing when you're a young woman in a strange man's house and he's not well? And you know all the things you know about the way that the dynamics between men and women work. It's trying to get, it's that stuff. I, I'm not generally a person who would go in and say, flinch. But I'd want, to, I'd want to remind someone why they would be frightened. Got it. The given circumstances of, of this, this scene and presence, like like Chloe was talking about earlier. Um, David, um, you also had to deal with uh, character uh, and characters, but one character being drunk um, and that issue. Um, what did you the to uh, discover? Or how did you discover the very sort of well? Level? Um, I had Gary Oldman. So I, 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 we, we talked about, you know, um, we, we talked about his, the, the degree of sloppiness. Obviously Herman was, you know, he had vomited at people's homes before. So, um, he had, he's taken inebriation and his comfort, uh, in it, um, to levels that, uh, very few of us have have experienced before um but but you know uh, the 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 biggest thing was to make make sure that in all of this that the writer comes through right because as inebriated as herman gets he's making a point and he is and so the you know you, you you're you're adjusting the elocution so that you can make sure that you can still hear his reason for rising and getting everyone's attention. It, it, it was a degree, uh, I mean, you know, we, again, I shot a few takes and so we would kind of dial it back in and I would say, you know, this is wonderful what's happening over here, but right in here, I can't hear a word you're saying. So, and he would, okay, okay, okay. And, and that, that was, that was really it, you know, he's had some experience with this. And so he, he knew to the, you know, he, he could kind of, you know, he could modulate it and say, um, this is half a bottle of vodka in. It was like, yeah. It was like, okay. And when, when you say, when you say, for example, that last scene, which, uh, 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 around the table where it yeah, yeah. essentially tells the, um, the, yeah. the, the story. Um, I don't know if that's his most excessive one. But because of what you just said, and because we, you, know, I, you do uh, do a lot of takes, and and uh, have explained why, which makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's a style that gets the yeah. actor almost into a, a habit of uh, release in a way. Um, and th the question here is, were you able to do that with this, or do, because it is a sort of a excessive performance uh, moment? Yeah, I, 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 I didn't. I didn't change it up. I did. I didn't. <laughs> change it up forget i mean look you know it, it, it in the end we shot that scene for four days and so there's probably 32 camera setups and we probably did some in the neighborhood of 12 to 16 takes per setup so it was it was a good almost a almost a good part of a week so you know the in the end you know and 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 I think that the, the, the aspect of the takes thing becomes, you know, front and center. It's really, for my money, how quickly you get to the next take and how quickly you can, uh, dispense with thoughts and musings on what it is that you've just seen. So it's not so, I, I, what, what I really sort of resist is this idea of, 
um, the actor now going and processing it. You know, that's why I don't like slates. I don't, I don't like putting something on somebody's face and making noise. I just want to go. And so we will do a nine minute take and then his shirt will get tucked in and his tie and his hair will be combed and he'll sit back down and we're rolling, you know, eight seconds later and starting all over again. So and that. Might have you in that moment of his shirt going in given him, or what would you if you did give him any adjustment between I mean, those? They, they, they would be, it would be myriad. It would be, it could be, you know, 15, 20 things. I could, I, I, I might walk in and walk him back to his chair and say, the beginning third is really, really good. Remember that you're saying this, this is just between you and Louis. You were saying this just as, you know, a stick for him. You don't, don't, don't look at, Charles for for until you get to this you're you're auditioning this idea it's still you're not quite comfortable in it this is more about Louis see Marion you know be in that moment have some you know and I'll give him I, I I like doing this I like to inundate actors with a lot of things to think about and then quickly just go again so that they are not reeling um it's just you know I find that the things that when people recognize something that they go, oh, I, I, I would like to take ownership of that. It sticks. And the stuff that they go, oh my God, this is such bullshit. You know, that <laughs> tends, to, tends to fall off the edge of the table. By the way, when you're shooting, um, uh, are there times where you will not cut or, or just keep the camera rolling? Um, so that obviously in digital, it isn't expensive unless you're shooting film. Um, will you, because of the repeatedness, just keep, yeah. uh, with, you know, without, without even saying yeah. that? There, 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 there's a famous technique that, um, that, um, Frank Capra used to use and it, and it was because he was only allowed to print two takes. And, um, so he used to do this thing where he, would keep the cameras rolling and say, okay, start over. And everybody would go and, 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 and this is the way that he could get four or five take over the two yeah. that he was allowed to print. And what he found was that it immediately hyped the actors immediately, like the energy level rose because nobody wanted to be caught out with their stuff, not in the right pocket and going in, in and out of the door and making sure you have your coat over here, that there was this, um, it, an energizing technique. It was, it was the panic ended up being kind of this in, in a weird way. The style of the thirties was like, you know, this like, say your lines, don't knock over the furniture. Let's, you know, circle that one. Let's move on. And, and, and it's, it's interesting how that, I don't find that it's that technique of, all right, let's go again. Keep it rolling. Everybody back to one. Um, I don't find that to work usually for the first third because you do get these sort of elevated anxiety of people washing, you know, rushing through the door. Like, you know, there's a fire in the next room, but, um, but, you know, by the time you get to the end, this is all, um, this is, this is all psychology and, and, and all of your, your, your palette will change depending on the, um, personality types that you're dealing with. There are certain people, certain actors can hear, yeah, 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 that was all bullshit. I'm really only interested in this and they can, focus on that and they were and sometimes i mean it and, and to emerald's point it, it's not about it's not about deceiving them but it's about knowing what their threshold is for um new thoughts on subtext or new thoughts on and and you can inundate people and people do go into vapor lock and and so you you don't want that but and i have found you know a, a, a a very useful, not trick, but a useful technique is if you really want an actor to focus on this one little moment in the text and you draw their attention to it, you may be doing yourself a disservice because it may, it, it, that may be the cause of their sort of creative constipation is that there's too much. So I find Often you can, if you really, really want to get the end right, give them 12 notes about the first three lines. Mm -hmm. And once they get through those first three lines, there's like <gasps> this sort of like release. And then you find that the middle and the end just, you know, are mm -hmm. like water off the back of a duck. And you just yeah. go, great, we're moving on. 
I, a, and I don't guy. recommend that you <laughs> do that. <laughs> Actually, it's very people, smart. But... I like it. Chloe, let me ask you. Thank you, David. Um, <laughs> Chloe, in terms of getting Fran to do, um, there are a number of wonderful moments, obviously, um, where she is listening and responding. Um, and I'm interested in the conversations that you uh, had uh, with her um, about particular ones, um, either where you need you either quote rehearse them or how would you readjust if you wanted Fran to do something different? Yeah, I, I, you know, the I have learned the word final check uh, in a hard way. <laughs> That that word really, well, I I still have nightmares about it because it, I think what David's saying earlier about having a, you know give your notes, but as quick as you can get back into it before they start to, and then sometimes you get them there and then the final check comes in, and when there's a lot and then you 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 go oh man like because they're completely now aware you know that obviously that's not what I did on No Man Land, but I, it's just something that I've learned. So so so. I guess as as little as that is possible, whether you're in the middle of nowhere or on a stage, that you could keep the the actor be in their body than than aware of things, you know. So I I I um I know that a lot of people asked David about the makeup uh for for uh, um 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 sorry yeah sorry yeah, and, well, and so I, I really, yeah I really glad you didn't do that because um. Because Gar Gary, you know, because there's something about, yeah, I, I, I'm not getting into it. And, and so with Fran is that we wanted nothing between her and the camera. Um, and when I did, when we had the ability to work that way, my work is half, more than half, like 80% done because she is present in this moment. She's listening and the cam, and the lens is very sharp and it's very close to her face. We're going to capture and also amplify it as much as emotion she give us as possible. Um, and um, um, occasionally with friend, really, just about going in and, and go 50, give me like four different options, 25%, 50, and 75. And then she would do those like a pro and would decide. That's my, favorite, that's my favorite direction. You go to an actor and you say, just 11% less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but if we, Things like Fran's looking at those photographs of, which I assume of her past, which we don't really know. Yeah. Um, what did you discuss with her? Um, and, and uh, you know, what did, did she know? Uh, obviously, who these people were that she's looking at, and what uh, what you you wanted her to respond to just by looking at them. I'm I'm interested in in something like that in terms of your if you needed to adjust her performance or how you just. Got in conversation about how she's going to look at her past. No, not so much. Um, I again, w when you set up the situation, also a lot of that is like where she is, what's the lighting is like, what's the time of day, where's the camera. You know, all that to me is equally as important as adjusting the actor in that moment because the audience is going to have to feel that. You know, is that and uh, through a small frame. And and I, um, a lot of my attention goes into these things. And then uh, again, it was very important for me to have uh, an actor that fits the roles perfectly. I, I think my hands might be a little tight if I miscast, um, because I'm not that type of, uh, like I, I would love to do theater just to learn. I would love to direct a play just to learn how to rehearse, how to work with actors in that way, um, to, to, to get better. But that's not, I, naturally, I'm not like that. So I really expect whether my non actors or a professional actor to come in having done their ho own homework and done their own exploration and then just show me. And then if the, if it's so off, I will make adjustments. But it, I found that when were, you were, right, were, okay. were there any moments in this when for you, that you remember where it, quote, was so off and you did have to make an adjustment? Um, uh, uh, yeah, there there are definitely a, a few times. But then you, you sort of go in there and you, 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 you go just try – Try something completely different. Sometimes I will even just give that direction. Just try something completely different. Show me what else you got. And not, not with the non-professional actors. <laughs> they look at me like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> uh, but let's try something different. Or like, again, it's like less, just even less. 
um, again, oh, I'm matching as well. I'm matching the two different uh, school of, uh, you know, different with matching someone just being themselves and then someone com- uh, coming from a different school of, of performance. And less, less, uh, how, how about nothing? Give me nothing. Uh, and then see, see how that is. And, and, uh, um, occasionally I'll go, nothing, right? Nothing. And then, go, oh, that's pretty good. Uh, it's, but again, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure until I'm in the edit room. Got it. Uh, and you're, so and you're like, editing all the time. But here's the, when you had David and, and, and Fran working together. Now, these are two very, very experienced actors. And yet you want the style of their performance to equal the style of all of your non-professionals. What, for example, in their scenes, what did you three talk about or discuss or do in order to get that s- similar reality? The three of us knew we had to do actual work in order to match. Um, so uh, uh, we would uh, occasionally I would tell them to throw the script out um, or, or like do it at the end. Like eventually get into it, just start doing, just talk about stuff. I don't even tell them what it is. Just say, someone say something. <laughs> and then they just start to talk. And then occasionally, and they're pros, you know, occasionally they would sneak a line in and then start it, start. It does help, you know, and they help each other out as well in that way. You know, when, when the trust is built from the beginning and you know the goal is to become as naturalistic and it doesn't feel like things are too written because of what a non-professional actor is going to do, the effort is made towards that. And, and they, they, provoke each other as well. They tried to get each other there. So that Got was right. Did they ever sort of talk to you about, I don't know if I can do that? Um, or was that ever a, I, I, I see for Fran it wasn't, but I'm just curious for David, did he ever say, wait a minute, where do you want me here in terms of the performance I'm going to give? Or what kind of conversation did he have with with you? Oh, yeah, no, not, neither of them ever said, like, oh, I can't do that. Because it's, it's really about, I think it's about doing less. Um, so you can definitely do less, you know, sometimes you might not be able to do more, but do less is, uh, and, and occasionally, I mean, with David is never an issue, but with friend, we, we, we had to look up for a boundary because so much of her personal life is in this film. And she would actually said, have said, there's a lot more of my personal life in here that you don't even know that I have to, you know, that's, that's, that's in there that she give to the film. Um, and, um, and I think for me and her is to find that find that balance to make sure she's not too vulnerable exposed. Because one thing I have learned so much from Fran about, and I I really have to keep learning this, is that for actors, they they, they do need some security. They they do need, you know, they didn't, it's not like the non-professional actor who choose to, I want to share my life with you. You know, they, 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 the reason why they want to put on the costume, do something, sometimes they don't want to share themselves on screen. And I'm fully expecting them to because I've only worked with the other way. So I have to learn how to make the professional actor willing to give me what I want to a certain degree, but also knowing that I can trust them to not have to open themselves up that like that still gave me the same performance. That trust I still I, I'm building, you know, because I, I, I was like, no, you got to give me you. But now that's not always true. I have learned. Oh, wow. Isaac. For you, uh, readjusting and particularly dealing with the kids. Thank you, Claude. Um, uh, what, what, and how would you um, um, readjust and get performance? When we saw that example, obviously with the chest, but uh, speak, speak to that in terms of uh, other examples where, if you needed to readjust, what you would do, and maybe both with adults and the kids, but particularly with the kids because of the, I think the remarkable performances that you, you got. So, how would you adjust? Thanks. It, it it really depended scene by scene. So each scene had a different approach and different strategy. Um, I mean, there there were moments, I, I think it's kind of similar to what Chloe's saying, because they are first time actors, th- these kids. Um, so a, a lot of times with them, I'm just looking for the most authentic uh, part of themselves that they can bring within any given moment. Um, for, for instance, one of the key scenes is them reacting to the parents fighting. Um, and I, I noticed that, you know, they're throwing paper airplanes in that scene. So they just started to have a really good time with it. Um, uh, because, you know, kids throwing paper airplanes, they're going to start to smile. And that was kind of wrecking the, the reaction shots. Uh, and I, I remember for that one, I, I did have to be very stern and start to put on a whole different fa- face with them. Um, that was on, on a more intimidating level, I guess. And, 
Um, so, so there are moments that I have to create that atmosphere. Um, I, that makes me sound like a tyrant. I mean, the, 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 there are other moments that, that aren't like that. You know, um, if, if, if moments of fun, we try to make sure that the set is fun and that, um, they're going to have a good time in a certain moment. Um, so I felt like that environmental element was really important. Um, but there are also a lot of scenes where these kids were just phenomenal without much direction at all, in which they just knew what they they needed to do. So I don't want to make it seem like it's all smoke and mirrors and that I'm just tricking them the whole time. Uh, but, you know, they, they're, they're really talented kids. Um, with the adults, it's it's more or less, uh, I mean, uh, everybody has said it already, like it's everybody is different. And uh, I find the rehearsal process to be important to and how figure do you- out to learn. How do you use a rehearsal process? Um, I, I try not to, I try to make sure to talk throughout it so that I, I create some kind of, I don't let them fully get into the scene so that part of it, they're still working it out mentally. That, that's what I tend to do. And so I try to make it a little bit, um, you know, I don't get quiet and let them do it. I, I just say, yes, okay, okay. And I, I talk through it um, so that I can try to preserve when the cameras are rolling that first time that they're doing it and i notice each actor has a very different thing that helps them if i need to make adjustments um often it's it's great and there there there's not much of an adjustment to be made and it might be just a technical thing i try to let them know quickly if it's only a technical issue that we need to resolve then i try to let them know so that they um they can stay within the comfort and confidence of what they've just done um, but if it's something needs to be adjusted, then it, it's really according to them. Like for, for Yoon Ya Jung, uh, the, who plays the grandmother, um, she doesn't like to talk about motivations and she doesn't like to talk about psychology and all that. She'll just say, you know, are you asking me to just be quieter? And I say, yeah. She said, okay, just tell me to be quieter. And, and she'll do it. She'll nail it. And she's really great at it. And then other, there'll be other actors who want to go, into the reasoning like what is the reason why i'm being quieter you know what so um i, I just try to meet them where they are got it in the things seems like that i'm going to move on a little bit to camera um but but in the scene where there's the fight between uh, literally you have filmed film one of the fights between the husband and wife um and in fact your camera um uh, you know goes back and forth between the two of them two of them um the performance moment of getting those two actors to be where you wanted them to be. Uh, do you remember any adjustments that you made with them to in that particular uh, scene? Um, that that one, there wasn't too much to. I mean, we. I remember having to make sure that the set is completely focused for that day, and that uh, I, I could see how much preparation the actors were doing with with that one. So even like final checks and all that stuff, we we definitely pared down as much as possible, and we made sure to clear the set more with that scene, uh, just to give them the concentration. Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't remember too many adjustments with that scene in itself. I, it was really with the kids, um, but the two. Adults, I, I was afraid that they're going to lose their voices because uh, I, I kind of told them this is a scene in which you're really not holding anything back. So I knew we couldn't do too many takes and they, they lost their voices with that scene. Let me ask you one more performance thing and then I want to uh, talk about camera. Um, the performance thing is uh, the shot on grandma, on her last shot. Um, do you remember what you said? She says <laughs> yeah. no. Uh, okay, so, so that one was great because... Uh, we we all set it up, and I wasn't talking to to YJ much about that scene. Uh, but right before the cameras rolled, I just went up to her and I said, "You know, I, I just need something mysterious." And we we shot it, and uh, and she did the exact look, everything, just as you see it. And then as soon as I said cut, she just turned to me and said, "Mysterious enough for you?" <laughs> <laughs> and it was. It was great. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you just coming off of what Em said earlier about you know the sort of the thinking about what's going on? Did you ever did you after ever, ever ask her what was the mysterious for you, or did, did, you, did you ever find out? 
Uh, I never found out. I mean, we we talked about this scene a little bit. She she only asked me once, like, "Do you want me to cry in in it?" And I said, "I don't. I don't think. I think that would be too much." And so that was the only kind of note we had during the script phase, because oh. during the script phase we kind of talked about uh, different moments. So she had notes on that scene. I knew she was preparing for it, right. and I just added that one note right then. You know, it's interesting, though, because if in that scene, her her eyes are wet by the time you cut. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so um, clearly she didn't take your direction. She did mysterious. Well, she didn't. I mean, that's the thing. She didn't I, ever I, let it come down, which is. I know. No, I, I, I did a hell of a job with that. That no, she still amazing. got what she wanted and I got what I wanted. So. <laughs> <laughs> no question about it. It's quite it's a great moment in the movie. Um, and um, I want to talk a little bit about camera with you. Um, there's a, a wonderful shot where it's pretty much in introducing all the characters in the courtroom. It's almost goes a sort of 180 degrees. I think it starts on Ferran and Schultz and then moves through the table to sort of reveal all of the, all of your defendants. And I'm interested because I know that, that, because you've spoken to this about this, the, you know, learning how to figure out how to shoot a, uh, with camera or cameras, um, sort of an action scene, but setting something like that up. Um, do you remember, was this something that you preconceived, something that you talked with uh, with your camera person about? Speak to how you were working with the camera. I like that shot specifically. Uh, yeah, that shot specifically. Um, uh, it, it's, we're being introduced to the courtroom uh, uh, and, and, and its participants. Uh, and uh, I, I, I had staged most of it on a piece of paper um, and staged a little bit more of it uh, when we got into the courtroom uh, on the day. Uh, basically, I, I, I wanted uh, I wanted to see how long I, I, I could do a continuous shot. So it was a matter of uh, starting on J.C. McKenzie, who was uh, playing Joseph Gordon-Levitt's boss. He's just sitting there. Everybody's waiting. For the trial to start, everybody's waiting for you know the all rise moment. Uh, uh, I, he leaves the frame, revealing uh, uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt. Uh, uh, he stands up, and from there, the camera is able to move to Fred Hampton uh, and his guys coming down, or move along the defendants. Um, you know, I decided the moment where okay, we can sort of release from this shot uh, uh, now and. Uh, and move on, uh, but that was a choreographed move. You know, in, I wanted, the, if, if you don't mind, enough, yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted to. I know you wanted to move on to camera, but I, I, I just wanted to uh, address uh, giving adjustments, please, uh, please. to actors, please. because I, I once had a very bad experience uh, that that I try to learn from, uh, and I wasn't the director of the film. I, I'd written the film. I was working with another director. We were in rehearsal, and uh, the director had called a meeting. He wanted to meet with an actor uh, uh, before the morning's rehearsal, and he wanted me there. And first of all, it was already a, a powder keg that was set to explode at some point because this actor, through a bizarre set of circumstances, was aware that he was not my first choice. Uh, uh, for the role, so he went into that uh, kind of wary uh, of me, and uh, we had this meeting. The director said what he wanted to say, then turned to me uh, and you know, said, "Aaron, you want to add something?" And so I, I just wanted to add so wanted to add something very simple. Uh, it, it, in so many roles. Confidence is incredibly important. Um, um, you know, the actor being being confident, being able to really own the ground uh, under their feet, uh, is incredibly important. And so I, and it was as it was uh, with this role. Um, and what I said was, this guy's a movie star. And what the I think what the actor heard me say was. I wish we had a movie star playing this role. And the actor tore up the rehearsal room, literally, uh, uh, 
pulled things off the wall, and smashed them, and, um, uh, and it, it it was nightmarish. And uh, I never want another experience where I where I lose the actor. Um, I don't want anyone locking themselves in their trailer. Um, or, uh, or, you know, just kind of closing themselves up uh, on the set, uh, because in trying to give them confidence, I've taken away all their confidence. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm careful about, uh, the way I give notes. Got it. Got it. Got it. Would you say, Aaron, that when you're saying that, that, that the note is more encouraging if it's, even if you want something changed as distinguished from critical, I'm, I'm using words. I would say, first of all, the more specific the note can be, uh, uh, the better. Second, you have to make sure that you're not asking the actor to do something that they can't do, uh, uh, that you're not asking them to speak a foreign language. You know, be funnier is a bad note. Um, I uh, agree. <laughs> right. Uh, so it's uh, again, you, you want to be giving them confidence. Um, uh, and if you can give them something specific, you'll also, you know, you learn uh, actors are all different, uh, right? They all need and want a, a, a different thing. Um, uh, and so you learn, uh, uh, with, with different actors. Here's what you say to this one, and here's what you say to this one. Got it. Um, I'm, uh, in, in, this may also refer to both, both performance as well as, um, 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 camera. Um, there's a night sequence, um, where I think you move past Abby, um, and then pick up, uh, Tom Aiden and Rennie as they're, they're walking and you track back with it. Um, and it's a, it, it's a, Big night setup because you've got a lot of people there. Do you remember? And this is also, I think, a one or that that or that, that that as I said, uh, finds Abby and then discovers Tom and Rennie and moves back back with them. Do you remember setting that one up? Um, because that also, you know, lights, night, all the rest. Um, uh, how did that one re evolve? If you remember. Uh, sorry, I, I was saying that those scene that scene that you're describing that those were exciting nights. Uh, we we shot those scenes in Chicago in Grant Park and on Michigan Avenue. Uh, where they took place. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, and, uh, I remember choreographing them, uh, uh, and choreographing the camera moves always, uh, you know, in concert with Faden Pop and Michael RDP. Got it, got it, got it. And using oh. as, um, I, I hate to be glib about this, but, uh, because there was so much tear gas used, tear gas used, um, in, in Chicago in 1968, it was a lucky break for me, uh, because we got to use a lot of smoke, which looks nice when you shoot light through it. Um, and, uh, we got to use a, a few hundred extras to play thousands uh, of people, uh, because I could, I could mask things with smoke. Yeah. Tear gas is often overlooked as something that can help. As a kind tool, of, uh, in yeah. filmmaking. <laughs> it, it, makes it, it makes it a lot easier. I, this. I mean, oh. you say that now, David, but how yeah. many times did I ask you, you to use tear gas? Like tear gas. Right. Magic, yeah. tear gas. Magic tear gas can be difficult. That's why when I did my version, I didn't have any tear gas at all. It was easier. M, you made some very, very specific choices in terms of camera. You're, there are a lot of short sightings. There's lots of uh, shots that have headroom. There's lots of cent, you know, centered shots. Can you talk about your use of camera in this particular movie? Yeah, I think like everything in the movie, it's it was about kind of uh, making it um, feel like Cassie's world. So she's very contained and formal um, and still, and so. A lot of the time it was about creating these kind of tableaus that were quite, yeah, quite formal and old fashioned in lots of ways it was, and static. Um, I think it, it really helped often people, as you said, people kind of off center. It's, well, there's sort of slightly too much headroom or you're kind of, you're prioritizing the things in the, in the frame maybe that are surprising and, and that, 
that was yeah, it's enormously helpful when you're talking about somebody who's kind of stultified. Um, and it meant that when we did use study cam, like the tiny, tiny bits we did, which were whenever Cassie's kind of, you know, either falling in love and loosening up or, or she kind of lost control and, it, you know, emotionally and, and things were kind of, yeah, falling apart. It, you, you really felt it. We felt those moments. So, um, so things, so things like the scene in the pharmacy, total different camera style than, other scenes where you're much more formal, but but talk also about in in, in fact the scene we, uh, that we had in the clip, um, the short siding. Um, this is a technique that you know um, listen is used a hundred years ago, but it's also something that's become quite common now. And I'm interested in how you sort of committed to it and why what you feel what you feel from it when you use it. Well, I'm so sorry. To what is short siding? <laughs> oh, well, short sighting is this. Yeah, David and I are going to, let's see, David, I don't know where I'm you so are. sorry, DGA. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm with you. No, no. So, uh, Em, Em, it has on to be. On, on, on a single with the looking room, if a character's yeah. looking right to left, mm -hmm. oftentimes you create, you know, s some people will register the person in the center of the frame. Some people will give them looking room, and then you can also take that looking room away, and they can be. You can see the edge of the frame here, and it leaves more room for thought. So, for example, so I think even though we've got mirrored screens, David, if you go to your screen left, and I go to my screen, we're going to be probably <laughs> I, you know, yeah. somehow. The point is, then the normal thing would be to have them separated. I, but what you've done is you you put them sort of they're right next to each other, and so the phrase is used short siding it. And I'm shocked you yeah, don't know. So why did you choose to do those, or did someone say this? Well, I, I think I mean my completely mortifying lack of um, <laughs> jargon. Probably it's so okay to say it looked cool. Probably, yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. It did look cool, but I think actually the truth of it is for me is it's kind of most things are, even though it sounds incredibly um, pretentious and ridiculous, the kind of psychological choice. And so it means, you know, obvious creating space, the, the, the negative space is just as important to, as the positive space, I suppose. And, and the sense of unease that you can get by putting people too close together or putting too much space between them. Or, you know, some of the time you find that Cassie was centered and other people aren't because they're kind of slightly out of, yeah, they're, they're kind of not comfortable. It's for me, generally speaking, it, it was kind of, yeah, it was, it was, a, it helped create tension, I suppose. Got it. Got it. Got it. I'm fascinated with this. Um, let's talk about working with our directorial team. Let's talk about working with assistant directors. Um, David, what's your experience, particularly on Mank, in working with your assistant director? Um, well, I hadn't worked with Richard before. We 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 had talked about um, uh, well, we had talked about we were going to do another film, and then that went away. And so um, I asked him if he wanted to do Mank, and um, so it was the first time that. Um, uh, somebody sort of outside my um, um, sphere of influence had had been subjected to me um, with with no warning. So um, I I I I love Richard and thought he was uh, incredibly um, he's the perfect guy for this movie because it was it was very much. Listen, I had been living with this thing for so long. I had staged the whole movie five or six different times with 10 or 12 different cast members in each role. And so I had been thinking about it for so long that it was, it was, in, it was essential to like actually kind of see it through, through the eyes of people who, who weren't expecting every moment and didn't know white wine came up with the fish. And it, it, it was, a, it was actually a, a great thing, but I, I normally work, um, with an assistant director in a, in a slightly different way, I think, than, than most. Certainly n not than maybe, maybe Aaron probably, but I, I, I don't leave the set. I don't have a trailer. 
I don't have, I have Wi-Fi and I'm in my chair and I'm got a laser pointer and I'm going, what's that dude? <laughs> what's, that, what's that guy doing hanging that lamp up there? I don't want that. Like, you know, I'm, I am, I am the proverbial fly in the ointment. So, so I think I was probably very taxing for, for Sam and, and for Richard and, and, and Matt, but I, but I, I try to be, I, I try to be, you know, I'll never be a, a soft cushion <laughs> to land on, but I, I try to be at least, um, understanding of there's a certain amount of inertia that, that 90, 90 people have and getting the whole, that getting the whole thing on its feet in the morning is always for me the, I want to get out of the gates fast, and so. Uh, what are you what What are you asking your assistants, the assistant directors, to specifically do for you? I mean, is it scheduling more important, or is it their behavior on set to, in fact, make the set move, or is it dealing? No, with I'm I'm pushing the set. You know, I and 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 not in a not in a. Um, no, I think. I, I'm looking for somebody to be my eyes and ears in terms of, um, you know, I get this a lot, you know, from, from, you know, the, the costume designer, you know, Trish Somerville, somebody I've worked with a lot. And, you know, we have a whole screening process for like crazy extras <laughs> and she will, you know, after seeing everybody in the trailers and getting everybody ready and they're in the hair and makeup, she will come and she'll be able to say, okay, this person, deep background, because I don't know they're going to make it the whole day. And this person, you do, you, you, not a great listener. Um, and she'll like download it all for me so that I have, wow. so that I'm kind of armed with, you know, and then I work with the AD to make sure that, um, uh, we're, everybody's focused on the, I'm never going to be the guy who's going to go to his trailer and be presented with somebody's idea of what it should be. Got I mean, Aaron's been there. It's, it's, it's not, it, it's not so much about like, you know, everyone is conspiring to fuck me, but it, it, it's simply that I, I, where else am I going to be? Like, what am I going to be doing? I'm not going to be watching. Got it. Got it. All right. Chloe, Chloe, tell us about work, but particularly on this kind of film, um, working with your assistant director. Um, we, we have a very, uh, if I look at, if I like, I have a top view of how the, the set is run is that there's a little core and that's me, the, uh, our, uh, sound, uh, production sound mixer, DP and our actors. And it's 360. So everyone else either run real fast or they hide and, and everything else is making things happen far away. So our AD, Mary is really the point person between this core and the rest of the group that as we move forward, sometimes this needs to happen, the, the, the other team needs to make this thing happen as we move towards it while being 360. So she is as much as a strategist, also an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, she has to run there fast enough to get these people in the right place and, and, then, and then hide in time for, um, so she definitely had the right, the type of attitude. And she, she is excited about that. She worked with Ben Zylan, you know, on Beast, uh, Beast Southern Wild and Wendy. So she came from that world and she's excited about, uh, trying to go into the real world and, and, and control as much as we can. And, um, I also, I, I like to be quite in charge with the schedule just because it's, um, it's sort of in my head with the, with the, the, the whole thing with the edit and I watch the daily the night before rewrite. So I, it's almost me and me, my DP to, to put this together. And Mary, uh, did what would basically be a voice of the producers and the, and the logistics and telling me actually you can't do this and that and that. And then, and then it's to tell me what I, what I, what are the parameters? And then I, so I get to play as much as I want. And, and so the, the communication, like you said, David, to start as quick as possible is to not have this big meeting where everyone's just talking. Is to just tell me the three, okay, what I can't do. Okay. Got it. And then just here's what I need to do. Go tell them right now so we can start and, and not be bogged down by big meetings in the morning. Well, one of the things about working with assistant directors is, is obviously working with background artists. Um, that, that sometimes is their responsibility. Um, and with things like the Amazon lunch scene where you've got, I don't know, a thousand people in that, do you remember, I mean, I, your assistant director may not have been able to help at all in terms of that, but I'm curious, since you shot that, how 
you set that one up with or without the, the help of your AD. Well, we, we, we cast the people that uh, are already working there. Um, so they, they just happened to be there at that time. And uh, I think we might have shot during the lunch. No, no, that's not true. No, we, we brought everyone. I think maybe after they finished lunch, we got people that agreed to stay. And then they just come back in and we, we position them in a way um, uh, that makes sense for the shots, especially the white shots. And then just, uh, yeah, and then that Mary is helping to coordinate out of that. So a lot of that is work with what you have. Got it. Right there. Yeah. Got it. Isaac, your work with the assistant director? Yeah, uh, with this one, it was just so rushed. Uh, I, I felt like we gave him an impossible task. Uh, Jeff Dubray was our first AD. Um, I, I think I, we got the master schedule on the first, or uh, when we're prepping. And I think the first day we we're shooting like uh, eight scenes on the first day. That was day one. And then our last day, we shot seven and a half pages of script. I still remember that number. Um, so, I mean, that was just the nature of, of this, this film. So what normally would happen is I would have my meetings with Lockie, our DP, and we would be figuring out how do we do this day. And normally with every scene, we know we can only max out at three or four setups. That was, that was like the number that, that we knew. So everything had to be very efficient. And Jeff had to be with us all the time, just listening and piecing things together. And then he would run off and, and, uh, and, you know, get everything organized while Lockie was just, he ran an impeccable uh, camera team. And um, yeah, it, it was just kind of that. He, he needed to be a good listener and just run and try to make it work. And one of the key things that was important for him was to always be whispering in my ear how much more time we have with Alan Kim. Because, you know, he only has six hours. So they'd say, okay, he just arrived. You have this amount of time. And then every Every hour or 30 minutes, they tell me, okay, you, you have this much more time with Alan. Um, so we'd have to react to that as well. Got, got, got yeah, it. I'm getting stressed just talking about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> it's okay. It's In okay. Fact, okay. I'm going to ask, ask, since our time is sort of gone running down, but I'm going to ask two more questions, but I still want to go on the assistant directors. Alan, um, with, with your assistant director, uh, what was your experience? We had a kind of legendary AD, uh, uh, Joe Reedy. Um, uh, uh, he's phenomenal. I, I, I was so lucky, uh, we all were, to, uh, to be able to work with him. You were able uh, to give him a lot of tips. Uh, <laughs> you know, some tips, David. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, no. So how, how to shoot action scenes, right? How to shoot action scenes, I'm sure you. <laughs> it, it was mostly about how to shoot action. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and by the way, uh, Isaac, um, for me, a seven-page scene is a <laughs> short one. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I obviously ran out of words. But it's only seven pages. Uh, and, uh, but Joe, uh, Joe ran the set. There were a lot of scenes in Chicago 7 with a lot of background. Uh, uh, so he, in his seconds, uh, had, had to run that, too. Um, but I would, uh, I, I had no preference in terms of the, the order that we were, uh, uh the order of the setups, uh, except that I always, obviously you, you want to start with the master. You want to start as, as far away as you can. I, I use that as rehearsal time, knowing I am not going to spend more than a second in the master, uh, uh once, once I get in the editing room. Uh, uh, but, but, and, and, uh, I leave it to Joe to move the set along. Um, you know, I, the only thing I would say to him, uh, is I, I, I get why it takes a, a long time to in between setups or sometimes even in between takes. But then we arrive at a moment where I feel like everything's been done already. We're, we're all here. We're ready to go. And what's happening now is just kind of abstract busyness that I don't understand. Um, and that's the moment where, uh, you flip your shit. And, and I have to believe that the other four of you have said this many, many times too. What are we waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> right? What is it exactly we're waiting on, uh, uh right now? This is where tear gas 
Or a taser, just a taser, a small one. How many times did I beg you to hit the Winklevoss twins with tear gas, David? <laughs> All right, I'm going to move on. M, tell us, assistant director. Now, you do know. Um, <laughs> no, I don't. I'm so sorry. I didn't understand what that job is. Um, God. <laughs> I do know what assistant director is. Look, I mean, it's sort of the same as everyone else. I hate meetings. I don't think I was in, I had a thing that I don't think I ever went into at once. I can't imagine anything more stultifying than having to discuss <laughs> that kind of stuff, actually, you know, um, in, in that way. I think you kind of, yeah. But, but really like Isaac, yeah. Poor Mike, wonderful Mike, who was the first, was just, Staring down the barrel of a schedule that was just <laughs> Sisyphean hell. And so a lot of it was like, yeah, a lot of it was like, how are we doing this? How can we? And I think I was probably very impatient. Um, a lot of the time I very much identify with like, what are we doing? What are we doing? <laughs> um, and there was a bit of that, but, but yeah, he was, he was on top of all of the uh, background artists and, and I think mostly, uh, I he was a kind of megaphone that makes it sound he was, but like a lot of the time, yeah, I just needed I needed um, somebody to strong arm people, and oh. Mike, the gentlest, kindest, kindest person in the world, but he was good at yeah manhandling. Really. I have two more questions for all of you. Um, the first question I'm going to tell you what they are, but let's go around the circle. Uh, the first question is the very last image that you leave your audience with in each one of your movies. Can you talk about that? The very last image. And the second, the last question I'm going to ask is what do you do with pressure? How do you, how do you handle pressure? So, but we'll go around first. M, that last image, which is, I believe, the phone, um, uh, talk about how that, how you decide to leave your movie, to uh, leave your audience with your last image. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a tricky one, a last image, particularly this, but I wanted Cassie to have the last say. Mm. And since she's, spoiler alert, dead, um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it was about kind of giving her, and also this is sort of like, it's a winky face emoji, which, I mean, look, <laughs> saying it out loud isn't quite embarrassing. The director will tell me it's a bit embarrassing, but that's the last thing. But, I think it's, uh, yeah, so it just kind of felt impish and silly and it had all of the kind of dark comedy and stuff that I wanted. Um, and then what was the second part of the question? No, I'm going to come around. It's what do you do with pressure? But okay. hold on to a second. You can have pressure by thinking about what you're doing with pressure when I go around. David, the last image in, in your movie. Now, it's it was in the script um, and it was a um, it was a hopeful um, um, you know it, it was nonsense it never really happened in real life. He was presented with a, with an Oscar after after the ceremonies and what he says in the film is something that he said to someone else um, but uh, um, yeah I, I, I shot the script. Got it. And, 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 and I deal with pressure. Um, well, no, not yet. Poorly. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. That's, I'm, doing this purposely. Purposely. I'm doing this purposely. Chloe, tell me, I'm going to come back with us. Chloe, what about you? The last image when she's walking you know, out of your frame. Um, well, that actually, that's not the last image, but interesting you say that because in the script, the last image is her leaving the door, right? And that's, I, I, when I went to Empire and did that myself during, during development, I knew that's the ending of the movie. And it's been like that. And then in, in editing, I didn't even think, like, that's the end of the movie. But then the lockdown happened and the pandemic happened. And I started getting notes saying, like, we need a little more hope. And you know me, I'm like, no. <laughs> and it ends with her leaving the house. And then they, as time went on, I go, ah, oh, yeah, it's true. Like, you came to the hope request? <laughs> <laughs> I, came at me. You know, I usually would never do that. You but are I, a great I, hope. I, <laughs> by, by, by like June, I was feeding the weight. And I go, you know what? Maybe it's time to see the van moving down the road and just keep going. And yeah, but, but some people feel like the film ended leaving the door. 
Um, so and and as a matter of fact, initially you did, and so you, then you have this other image, which uh, uh, it, it, what I'm interested in is, of course, the emotional effect that the last image of any movie is going to have. Now, obviously, the, the credits and the music and all kinds of other things going to happen, but there is that, and you're right. You, you have see you down the road, in a sense, uh, is the experience of your last image now rather than what I remember, too, is, as we're walking off. I got it. I got the evolution. Isaac, um, if I remember correctly, the last image it moves in on uh, the Minari uh, Creek. Do you remember yeah, yeah. where and how that evolved for you to be the last image in your movie? Yeah, I, I knew from the writing phase that I would end it there. Um, I, I never, I, what I didn't know is who would be at the Minati Creek. So that was something that I was working with. But um, I mean, it made sense to me to end it with it's Stephen Young and Alan Kim, the father and son, because um, ultimately I felt like this is something I was making for me and my dad and also for me and my daughter. So uh, just having that combination of father and the, the child together, um, it just felt right. It was an intuitive choice, really, not a not an intellectual one. Got it. In, in, including the camera move, because if I remember correctly, you move in on them. You don't pull away like sometimes sometimes you, we, we might do as a last shot. This one moves in, if I remember correctly. Right, right. We just move in very, very, very slowly. I think we did. That was one where we afforded ourselves a lot of takes. So uh, we, we tried it a number of times. Um, but yeah, we, we always knew that it needed to end with that slow push in, uh, that gets ultimately it's, it's for economy. Like you see the, uh, Minati patch, you see it growing and then you end with the two people. And I, I didn't want it to be, I didn't want to cut there. I wanted it to just feel like it's moving into the end. So. Gotcha. Aaron, for you, the, 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 it's an interesting experience in your movie because there is that wide shot that kind of freezes um, and, and then comes to alive again. Um, and then there are the actual, you know, actors that we actually get to see. Uh, how did the end of the visual end of your movie evolve for you? Uh, well, I, I too shot the script. Um, I was working with a writer who's kind of an asshole about that. Got to watch that. Yeah. Um, that guy's uh, tough. So it, well, I, I wanted the film to, uh, I, I wanted to feel good uh, uh, at the end of the film. I, I wanted it to to end with some inspiration. So it's the the reading of the names and um, uh, some people in the gallery cheering, some of them walking out uh, uh, in disgust. But the defendants uh, all standing up. One final act of defiance uh, in, in the face of power. Uh, Faden and I, you know, designed a a pullback and a nice high shot, and we knew we'd be freezing the image uh, for the postscripts that come on the scene. But the, uh, the the real final image isn't an image, actually, because we snap to black and then hear a thousand people chant, the whole world is watching. And then the music comes in and, and, uh, and we roll the end credits. Did you plan also early on to actually credit your actors? Because in many ways, the last image is, in fact, them. I'll, I'll tell you why I did that. Um, uh, no, I, I hadn't planned on doing that. Uh, but then I, well, I was, uh, uh, Daniel, uh, along with, uh, Celeste, uh, they on their own, on spec, uh, behind my back, they wrote a song, Hear My Voice, uh, which is nominated for an Academy Award for Best Song. Um, and, uh, I was told when I was in the cutting room that the music branch of the academy likes it more when, if there is an original song, when that song is over picture. Um, now, I couldn't put this song over the end of the film because it just didn't belong there. Um, uh, the score that, that Daniel had written uh, belonged there. So the best I could do in terms of putting it over picture was to uh, was to do the credits the way uh, I did uh, uh, with, the, with the actor's name, which, by the way, I always, as an audience member, I I find it kind of nice. I realize yeah. it feels a little like the Love Boat, but um, <laughs> American uh, Graffiti. But Got I it. like the Love Boat too. <laughs> and, and American Graffiti. I was lucky enough to to get the Crosby, Stills and Nash song for my my version of this uh, story. Right. But that was, that was years ago. M, um, let's. Uh, hit you with uh, uh, pressure. 
What do you do for pressure? I don't know what I do, but I, I think I think that my husband would say that I love it. I think I say I don't, but I I think I like it. But I just don't think you could do this job if you didn't kind of if there was and how do you how do you handle how do you handle it when you were feeling it? I think uh dead deadly calm with an occasional lapse of judgment. <laughs> but I like it. I think it's the I feel quite I feel quite calm when everything's the more pressure there is. The more the thing that freaks me out more than anything is too much time, too much money, too much time to think. Press the pressure is I think it's like Aaron, for you, pressure, how do you handle it? Uh, you know what? All, all I can do is do my best to not inflict it on, on the pressure I'm feeling to not inflict it on other people. Um, you know, people in my personal life and, and uh, people at work. I've given up on trying to not feel uh, a pressure. But um, like Emerald, I, I think maybe the reason why I'm not able to stop myself from feeling pressure is that I'm scared that if I didn't feel pressure, I wouldn't do anything. You know, that it's the pressure that's making me, that's making me right, that's making me make the film, that kind of thing. I got it. Well spoken. Isaac, what about for you? What do you do with the pressure? Um, I, I always feel like I, I just hold it all in, and uh, that last <laughs> day after best. production was... <laughs> yeah, I... The, the last day after production, I get sick or, you know, bad things happen because suddenly there's this release of that. And, uh, yeah, it, it's a weird thing. I, I, I'm sure so many directors know that, that feeling of once that's gone. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird that, that tension that you're holding for so long. I, got it. I don't know I got if that it. answers the question. But... Uh, it gets close enough. <laughs> 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 Chloe, what about for you? What do you do with the pressure? It, it it depends on what type of pressure it is. Um, but some days it's like that movie in Melancholia. You know, I'm very much I feel like Kurt Christie does in that movie. Like I feel I feel nothing, and it's the worst it gets. But other days I will cry with anyone, from a PA, an extra to the executive producer. I will cry to anyone who listens to me. I will just sob and sob, and then I, and then I, the pressure all and it's gone. It's probably you know, you guys will do that on set, but I, 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 I do. <laughs> David, what about for you? Um, I'll just inflict it on whoever's standing closest. Um, <laughs> that's what I thought. I just want, that's why I wanted you to look. No, I, I'm learning. I'm learning so many adult things here, like how to deal with pressure. I'm, I'm learning the, the end of your movie should have either hope or uplift, and not uremic poisoning. And 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 I'm hoping to apply all of this in in, in the future. But I, I invariably default to, um, uh, you know a walking vivisectionist and so i i try to sort of stay away from other people when i'm particularly morose <laughs> well listen uh, i i i want to thank all five of you for for spending the time with all of us you know sharing how you do what you do and do so well is a real gift so uh, on the behalf of the directors guild congratulations on obviously wonderful films and your nominations but also, thank you. Thank you just for spending time with us, and um, um, we appreciate it. So I'm going to say under pressure, this is the end of our uh, Meet the Nominees with the Outstanding Directors for Best Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks very much. Thank, yeah, thank you. you Thanks, everyone. Hi, kids. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Yeah.